This is Sabbath Thoughts and Reflections. It's a discussion of Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through chapter 3, verse 24. It's the second parasha in our three-year Torah reading cycle. Since the rabbis did not have a hand in naming the individual Torah readings in the three-year reading cycle, for the sake of reference, I've named this discussion, Who is to Blame for the Sins of the World, Adam or Eve? There's a lot of content to draw from this reading, so much so that a full in-depth study of this passage would take hours upon hours to conduct. There's just so much. In-depth study of each passage or verse should entail one looking at each of the various concepts, the topics, the issues, conducting word studies maybe, examining the Hebrew wording, lexiconal studies, and so forth. Well, for our purposes here today, it is not to conduct an in-depth study of this Torah reading, but rather to conduct an overview of what happened during the early days of humanity, leading to the popularly named Fall of Man. Indeed, this reading contains a number of themes that we could spend countless hours discussing. But for our purposes, we want to only touch upon just a handful of salient points of interest in our discussion from which, you, well, hopefully you may be led to conduct your own in-depth study. The other thing I need to point out before we launch into today's discussion is that we must always keep in mind that each of our Torah readings ultimately point us to our master, Yehoshua HaMashiach. Thus, whenever we discuss and study Torah, we should be compelled to look beyond the rote, the R-O-T-E, the rote, and see Mashiach's, Messiah's ultimate purpose and work on behalf of humanity. This is one of the things that separates us from our Jewish cousins when it comes to our focus of Torah. Now, I will be reading from the Robert Alter translation of Torah. And I've gone ahead and put the actual reading in the show notes or the transcript of this program for your convenience over at www.themessianictorahobserver.org. And if you would rather, instead of just listening, but you want to reference the transcript to this post, you are more than welcome to do so. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. This is the tale. Some English translations render tale as generations. This is the tale or generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, or rather, this is how the heavens and the earth came to be. Now, the term generations, our English term generations, in the Hebrew is toledo, toledo. It is a course of history. So we have in the complete Jewish Bible rendering the English term history used. In the NAB, we have the term story used. In the NIV, the NAS, the NET, the account. And in the Young's literal translation, we have the births. It's interesting the wide array of descriptors we have for tale or generations. Something to consider here at the outset of our reading is, from whom did Moshe, Moses, receive this accounting of creation? Obviously, Moshe was not present to witness the creation that he was inspired to record by the Ruach of Elohim, which leaves the answer being from the word or words of Jehovah Elohim. And this is certified in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. So Jehovah certified Moshe to record this. He commissioned Jehovah to record this, and we by faith believe his accounting. Verse 5, still in chapter 2. On the day Jehovah Elohim made earth and heavens, no shrub of the field being yet on the earth, and no plant of the field yet sprouted. 
For Jehovah Elohim had not caused rain to fall on the earth, and there was no human to till the soil. So here it is suggested that Jehovah created, and some people prefer to use the term recreated the earth to be tended to by his human creation. It is an interesting aspect of creation that man is to till the earth, to tend to the earth. It is one of his purposes to put to man for man to work, to also create as his Elohim created him and created all there is. Verse six, and wetness would well from the earth to water all the surface of the soil. Verse seven, Jehovah Elohim fashioned the human humus from the soil, that is human from the soil, which in Hebrew is hadama, hadama, and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the human became a living soul. So Jehovah formed man, formed Adam, and the Hebrew for form is yatsar, and yatsar is used by the author instead of the term hasa, which means to make. So it shows forth that there is this forming, this building of man from the soil of the ground, as opposed to Jehovah speaking and man comes forth, as opposed to man just spontaneously emerging from the ground, as some of the animal creations just emerged or appeared from that which they dwelt upon. So Jehovah breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, a creature, a living being, a living person. Now, the Targum Onkelos, the Targum Onkelos renders breathed upon Adam's face the breath of lives, and it became in Adam a discoursing or a speaking spirit. That which was in Adam was a discoursing spirit. That which animated Adam was a speaking or a discoursing spirit. Now, the Targum Onkelos is the official Aramaic translation to or of Torah. It is accepted as an authoritative translation of Torah and thought to have been written in the early 2nd century of the Common Era. The content of this work stems back to Ezra's time. However, it was later forgotten by the Jewish nation, but then it was re-recorded by this gentleman, Onkelos, who turns out to be a famous convert to Judaism sometime between 35 and 120 of the Common Era. Interestingly, we find in the book of Jasher, this extra-biblical book of Jasher, chapter 1, verse 2, as it pertains to this passage we're looking at right now, that Elohim forms man from the ground. He blows into him the breath of life and man becomes a living soul that is endowed with speech. So we have here another testimony along with the Targum Onkelos of Jehovah endowing man with a spirit of speech or the capacity to speak or to discourse, or to converse. So there's this underlying emphasis in the Jewish mind that Adam is a formed being who is gifted with speech. Interesting, huh? Now, part and parcel of Adam being the imager of Jehovah was his imputed speaking or discoursing spirit. And the concept of imaging Jehovah stems back to our discussion of Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27, and I'll put the links to that post in the show notes or the transcript of this program for your convenience if you're so led to go back and review that. We talked extensively about 
the concept of being of Adam and his descendants being imagers of Jehovah since that Adam was made in the image of his creator, being an imager of Jehovah, being made in the image of Jehovah. From the mean materials of the earth, the creator was able to form a truly remarkable human structure that the psalmist described aptly. Psalm chapter 139, verse 14. It reads, I will give thanks unto thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. So from the moist ground, man was formed by Jehovah. The passage at this early juncture of our reading sets the stage for what would become one of Adam's created purposes or divinely ordained task. Yah makes man from the moist soil of Eden and relocates him to the garden which is in Eden proper. And it is there in the garden that Yah tasks the man to tend, to till, to dress and guard the garden. Chapter 2, verse 15. And we'll touch more upon this dressing or tilling and this guarding aspect of man's purpose in just a little bit. Moving on to verse 8, still in chapter 2. And Jehovah Elohim planted a garden in Eden to the east, and he placed there the human he had fashioned. So it appears evident from this verse that Jehovah did not create or form Adam in the Garden of Eden. A lot of us have been raised to believe that man was made in Eden, the very place where he dwelt and the very place where he ended up sinning or transgressing Jehovah's commandment. Yah, in fact, established, or as the text here is interpreted in most English translations, Yah planted a garden in Eden. Now, how that planting of the Garden of Eden actually looked or what it looked like, we can only surmise. <laughs> but the garden was a self-contained place in Eden. The actual physical location of Eden has been a subject of great controversy and mystery for centuries. And many self-professing scholars and experts have persuaded many that they indeed know the location of Eden or the garden itself. But the truth of the matter is that no one truly knows where Eden is. If it is, in fact, a place that still exists here on earth. It does seem evident, however, that the garden where Jehovah placed his, the man and his woman was a place where Jehovah would train. He would commune and he would even test his human creation. And I would go so far as to propose that the Garden of Eden, if not the whole of or portions of Eden proper, hosted a manifestation or an extension of the kingdom of Elohim, the kingdom of Jehovah, the kingdom of heaven. For I've always said, where Jehovah's presence dwells, there we find his kingdom. For we find Jehovah is described here in our reading this week as walking in the garden in the cool of the evening to commune with Adam. And we find this in chapter 3, verse 8. Nevertheless, it is safe to presume that Eden existed at some point in the vast regions of Mesopotamia. Most scholars would agree with that. And the interesting thing about Eden likely existing in Mesopotamia is that ancient Babylon also existed in that region of the world. Clearly, the enemy is about counterfeiting the works of Jehovah wherever they possibly can. For if Eden was conceivably an extension of Jehovah's kingdom here on earth, Babylon, located in the same general region of the world, 
would be the earthly birthplace and headquarters of the kingdom of darkness, a counterfeit of Yah's earthly kingdom. I just found that to be interesting. Now, in the ancient book of Jubilees, which we kind of touched upon in our last post, Jubilees being an extra-biblical book that is considered not inspired and it's not part of the canon, our canon, it once was, especially in the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, but it no longer is. It was removed. And a lot of people have problems with it. There's some issues with in terms of its consistency with the content of our Torah, our five books of Moses that are actually the five books that uh, are accredited to Moses, which I believe they are. But there seems to at times be some contradiction between the two renderings. But it is an interesting book to reference from time to time in order to kind of get a sense of the Jewish mindset. How the Jews, which it was written by Jews, obviously, when it was written is controversial. Uh, many believe that it was written probably sometime in the first or second century. If indeed the book that we call the ancient book of Jubilees is that same book, <laughs> the transcript is, or the content makes up what we consider to be that ancient book of Jubilees, the same one. But it gives us an insight. The way I look at it is it gives us an insight of the thinking, the mindset of the Jewish sages and the Jewish writers and thinkers of that time. But in the ancient book of Jubilees, there is a sense of the garden being a holy place. I kind of touched upon that just a second or two ago. A holy place, a set-apart place, a dwelling place of Jehovah. Therefore, only the pure could enter and remain. And this is stipulated in Jubilees chapter 3, verse 13. There is also a sense that certain angels were given instructional charge over the couple in the garden. Chapter 3, verse 16 of Jubilees. So just some food for thought. I'm not trying to recruit people into using or, or you know, referencing or whatever the book of Jubilees or any of the extra biblical books. These are just things that I like to include as points of interest to kind of expand our perspective on our focus text. Let's go on over to verse 9. And it reads, And Jehovah Elohim caused to sprout from the soil every tree lovely to look at and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge, good and evil. The only thing we're told about the garden in terms of its composition is that it hosted every type of tree that was pleasant to look at and that bore good fruit, as well as the centrally grown trees of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And like so many of the elements surrounding this story, the spiritual significance of these two trees could certainly occupy our minds for a number of discussions. But we'll save that discussion for another time, Abba willing. I will say, however, that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, evil I'm sorry, <laughs> could be viewed as a test element, a testing element for Yah's human creation. The one thing we know about our Elohim is that he often tests those who would be his. He tested Abraham, Abraham a number of times throughout Abraham's lifetime. Abraham's walk with him, as well as Abba tested Yisrael throughout her wilderness sojourning. Now, I get it that some take umbrage with this thinking that Yah tests his human creation. Well, from a humanistic standpoint, it of course would appear that when Yah puts his human creation to a test, he is, he is in a sense setting his human creation up for failure. But that's not the case at all. 
To begin with, we know that Jehovah is sovereign and he is privy to deal with his human creation any way that his holy and righteous character leads him. Secondly, Yah respects humanity's free will. He will not force him or his ways on his human creation. So he gives humanity the freedom of choosing whether or not they will adhere to his instructions and keep his ways. Thirdly, Yah provides his human creation the opportunity to prove its allegiance, its obedience to, and total dependence upon him and his ways. We saw countless times how Abraham, Abraham, passed all the tests that were given to him. So it was not always this thinking of, oh, man is just not going to be able to pass Yah's test. No, men have passed that test. Abraham was one of them. And in so doing, Yah will graciously engage his human creation in a relationship. The process by which Father certifies whether an individual is suited to enter into a relationship with him is by searching their heart and ascertaining their intent. This is certified in Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 20, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, and Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 12, as well as Romans chapter 8, verse 27. We can also go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, and Psalm chapter 139, verse 23. Now, in the case of Adam and Eve and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the couple was faced with an easy choice to either stay within the confines of the relationship they enjoyed with the Almighty or seek to alter the parameters of that relationship for something that was more appealing to them. It turns out that the serpent, also known as the Nakash, had figured out that the couple would most certainly entertain becoming something other than that which Jehovah had originally established in and for them. In other words, abandoning their created purpose as immatures of Jehovah in the earth. This couple seemed to be ripe to do that, or at least Eve was at the moment. They chose to be like the gods. When we talk about the gods in this passage, those gods are likely the angels or demigods of the earth. And so there, and by extension, all unconverted humanity's hearts are not suitable for the covenant relationship Jehovah seeks to have with them. Now, in the midst of the garden, the creator established two trees, one, the tree of life, and two, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Interestingly, the, again, the Targum Onkelos renders the title of these trees as the tree of lives, lives being plural, and the tree of whose fruit they who eat know better or know between good and evil. The fruit they who eat know between good and evil. Interesting, huh? The Septuagint renders the second tree as the tree of learning the knowledge of good and evil. As our story progresses, it would seem that these two trees, located in the midst of the garden that was filled to overflowing with every conceivable and even inconceivable food for the couple to enjoy and subsist on, would serve as elements to test the spiritual resolve of the couple such that the obedience of the couple, the couple's willingness to remain entirely dependent upon Jehovah as their sustainer and sovereign. And we'll touch upon this concept of dependency in Jehovah being a central theme here in our Parsha for today. You know, I often wonder whether the tree of life provided the couple the means by which they would be physically sustained indefinitely. In other words, live forever. If so, this would clearly support the contention that humanity was not designed in its physical form to live forever without the nutrients provided by or the substance, not so much nutrients, maybe nutrients, I don't know, but whatever it was in that fruit that provided by the tree of life. 
that which was in the fruit from that tree or the leaves from the tree or what have you that would cause the human body to not deteriorate and die. In other words, it was Jehovah then, ultimately, that would provide the couple indefinite life through this tree if they remained in covenant relationship with him. For their life was not inherent in their being in their makeup. It was, it was not inherent in their being. It was not in their makeup. Just some thoughts. Just some thoughts, okay? We're just putting, laying down some some thoughts. This is, of course, Sabbath thoughts and reflections. Just my reflections and some thoughts that you yourself should enter into a study, if you're so led, to determine whether or not these are so. Interestingly, one of the great prophecies found in the book of Revelation entails of this same tree of life in the world tomorrow, providing sustenance and healing to the nations, which is a feature of the new Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Revelation chapter 22, verses 2 and 14. Let's return to our focus text. Chapter 2, verse 10 of Genesis. Now a river runs out of Eden to water the garden, and from there splits off into four streams. Verse 11. The name of the first is Pishon, the one that winds through the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Verse 12, and the gold of that land is goodly. Bedellium is there and lapis lazuli. Verse 13, and the name of the second river is Gion, the one that winds through all the land of Cush. Verse 14, and the name of the third river is Tigris, the one that goes to the east of Asher. And verse 15, and Jehovah Elohim took the human and sat him down in the garden of, a of Eden to till it and watch it. Keep that watch it in the back of your mind. Here we read of Jehovah placing Adam in the garden. And there is a hint of the garden being, as I mentioned earlier, a sacred place, as Jubilee hinted or proposed it being a set-apart place in the earth, a place where Jehovah would come and commune with Adam and conceivably Eve as well. And I would go so far as to suggest that the garden at that time was an iteration or a manifestation or an extension of the kingdom of Jehovah. It's conceivable that it was here that Adam learned specifically how Jehovah was to be worshipped and communicated with by his human creation. And some commentators have suggested that Adam was a priest unto Jehovah in the garden. And that would be something to really think about in connection with this understanding of this being a sacred place of worship where Father, where the Creator's spirit, his presence dwelt. So in addition to his tending, his dressing, his tilling, and his guarding of the garden, I would suggest that Adam and Eve, who is also referred to in some translations as Kabbalah, would have engaged in some form or some worship of Jehovah accordingly. How that looked, what that looked like, how it actually transpired, we don't have enough information. The other thing to bear in mind here is that the garden belonged to Jehovah. It did not belong to the man and his woman, despite their being given dominion of the rest of creation, despite Adam and Eve give, being given dominion over the rest of creation. Genesis chapter 13, verse 10, and Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13, proves this. And of course, it's endemic. It's part and parcel of what we find out because man is thrown out of the garden. <laughs> so if it belonged to them, if it belonged to Adam and Eve, they wouldn't have been thrown out, <laughs> most likely. Let's go back to our text. Verse 16, and Jehovah Elohim commanded the human saying, from every fruit of the garden, you may surely eat. Verse 17, but from the tree of the knowledge, good and evil, you shall not eat. For on the day you eat from it, you are doomed to die. 
The first recorded Torah commandment given to humanity with a prescribed penalty is given here. Fascinating. Fascinating. Which turns out that that you know penalty is of course death. That penalty, both physical and spiritual death. It's the prescribed penalty for sin. And here, Father passes this edict, not edict, wrong word, passes this instruction down to Adam. Verse 18. And Jehovah Elohim said, It is not good for the human to be alone. I shall make him a sustainer beside him. Now, the phrase Alter uses as sustainer beside him is from the Hebrew phrase Hetzer Kenigdo. Hetzer Kenigdo. Now, remember, I'm not a Hebrew scholar and I could be butchering these words, but that's why I put these things in the transcript, the show's transcript, the show notes for you so that you can go back and do your own verification and studies. <laughs> now, Hetzer Kenegdo or Kenegdo denotes more accurately a counterpart that comes alongside the man to actively work with him as well as work on his behalf. A counterpart, an agent, equal, who comes alongside and actively works with him and works on his behalf. Verse 19, still in chapter 2. And Jehovah Elohim fashioned from the soil each beast of the field and each fowl of the heavens and brought each to the human to see what he would call it. And whatever the human called a living creature, that was its name. Take note the importance Abba places here on naming and names. It's big here. It's big. Father places a lot of emphasis on it. Verse 20, and the human called names of all the cattle into the fowl of the heavens and to all the beasts of the field, but for the human no sustainer beside him was found. We should take note how Alter's translation emphasizes not just the naming of the animal creation, but also the fact that Jehovah had made his animal creation to exist in pairs or in groups. And the sustainer beside him is repeated once again to emphasize the reality that the man was alone without a sustainer beside him at this stage of creation. Verse 22, And Jehovah Elohim cast a deep slumber on the human, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed over the flesh where it had been. Here's something to ponder. Why did Jehovah use a rib from the man to build the woman? Now, many have surmised and speculated as to the answer, but the text does not provide any clear answer to this question. That's just something that has always been a source of curiosity for me. Verse 22. And Jehovah Elohim built the rib he had taken from the human into a woman, and he brought her to the human. Note here that Jehovah, as he did with the man, fashioned or built the woman. Humanity was the one element of the eternal's creation that he personally took interest in and formed and fashioned with great care. And so it stands to reason that man is uber special to the creator. Now, a special note as it relates to this verse, we find in the ancient book of Jubilees, specifically chapter 3, verse 8, that Eve was formed in the second week of creation history. Now, whether that's accurate or not, we can only surmise, but that's just the and, and, and something to just put in there as a point of interest. I'm not making it as a statement of truth or fact. It is just an interesting perspective. We know that Adam was made on the sixth day, and then Father rested from his creation. 
and then we get into chapter two, and then the whole process continues in the next period of time. We don't know how much specifically that time is, if we're talking days or we're talking weeks, but at some point, he ends up further along the line making man, I'm sorry, making woman, I'm sorry, making the woman, and the making of the woman comes about, it would seem, somewhere during the time that the animals are brought to Adam to be named. There's a lot there, and it is not a very clear understanding precisely of the order, but we can surmise, we can, we can kind of do our best to try to understand how this all looked. Verse 23. Take a drink. And it reads, the human said, this one at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, this one shall be called woman. For from man was this one taking. So the bringing together of the man and his woman in the garden was viewed by our master as the divine institution of marriage. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 and 5, as well as Shaul speaks of this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28. Now, I talk extensively about this institution of marriage in my post regarding marriage and divorce. And it's a series, I think it was a two-part series that I did last year, maybe. I don't recall, but I have the links to those posts in the transcript of this post in the show notes of this post for your reference if you are so interested and led to do so to check those out. The formation of the woman, though, comes about during and in response, it would seem, to the animal naming project that the Creator gave to Adam to perform. And it is the first time during this creation period that Father recognized something was amiss. That it was not good for man to be alone. Recall that throughout the creation week, Abba recognized that his creation or his recreation of the earth and the heavens, well, all of it by the sixth day was tov. It was good. And it was on the sixth day of creation, after he had made man, that the creator acknowledged that his creation up to this point was miod tov, miod tov, or very good. In other words, everything that Jehovah created or recreated was as it should be. It was in its proper place and it was fulfilling its respective created purpose. And this would include Adam. Indeed, order had displaced the chaos of Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. However, we see here that Father recognized that Adam was not able to complete his divinely given purpose alone. Chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. The man, in fact, required an equal partner, or as the KJV describes or titles, a help meet. Thus, the woman was formed from the rib of the man. And when the creator brings the woman to Adam, he responds with poetic approval. Well, at least it seems that way. For it was provided unto him, Adam, by Jehovah, from this point moving forward, a being with whom he could engage in discourse. Recall earlier that Adam possessed in some writings, especially in the Onkelos, a discoursing spirit. Well, in Eve, in the woman, we, Adam would have someone to engage in discourse with with whom he could be at oneness with, with whom he could speak or work with to keep and guard the garden, and with whom he could worship Jehovah in ways that he alone could not achieve. Again, I talk about this extensively in my post and discussion on biblical marriage. And again, I'll have the links to that post in the show notes for you. Getting back to our 
passage, let's go to verse 24, still in chapter 2. Therefore does a man leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife, and they become one flesh. Verse 25. And the two of them were naked, the human and his woman, and they were not ashamed. Of note here is the fact that the text emphasizes to us that the two were both naked and neither of them were ashamed. And this highlights the innocence and the purity that existed in humanity at this pre-fall juncture of human history. Like young children who are not conscious of their nakedness at bath time, for instance, the purity and innocence of little children is the state of being that Yehoshua is calling us back to in order for us to be admitted into the kingdom of heaven. Master spoke about this in Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. Now, I'm not talking about nakedness, but the innocence, the purity that children bring to our lives. We are thusly called to Teshuvah. We're called back to that place of innocence and purity that our first parents had in the garden before their fall. You know, I have to share with you, um, you know, all of our children, Hillary and our children, my children are, our three children are grown adults, all past 30s, in their 30s. And my oldest son has our two, only our two grandchildren. And it had been a while since we had children with us, <laughs> you know, the grandchildren over. And they were staying over for a number of days and it was time for bath. And we, you know, Hillary says, okay, guys, you got to get ready for bath. Go ahead and get yourselves ready. And they just strip right down naked. At the time, I believe our grandson was, that would have been 2018. So he would have been seven, maybe six. I want to say maybe about six. And my granddaughter would have been uh, about four at that time. But, but it was interesting because there was no shame. They just stripped right down. And it was so funny that my daughter, who was visiting us at the time, came in and they were both standing in the middle of the house, butt naked, waiting for their bath water to finish filling up. And she goes, oh, my, you are the both of you are so naked. <laughs> it, was, it just that just left an impression of me. But the point I'm trying to make is. That there was no shame, there was an innocence there. And it was not an issue of either of them seeing one or the other naked. It, it was that we had them at different places, different bathrooms, taking their bath. But it was interesting that they just did not have a sense that it was an issue to be naked. And so it was something for us to re-experience that purity and innocence of childhood that we had forgotten over the years because all of our children had long since grown up and gone and started their own lives. So just that that's the thing that really comes to my mind when I read this passage. But Jehovah declares that at that time, at this time, that it was not good for Adam, the man, to be alone. And we see here at this juncture of our reading that Jehovah is an Elohim of completeness. Completeness. Adam initially was not paired with a like being, as was the animal creation. And it's possible Jehovah up to this point was preparing the man for proper social interaction with his soon coming help meet. But it's not entirely clear in the text why Father didn't just create Adam and Eve at the same time. Obviously, Father knows what he was doing and he did what he did for his purposes and his will. Now, the Targum Onkelos of this passage describes Adam, describes the man as having or possessing a discoursing spirit. We just mentioned that several times. And it, this discoursing spirit is a character trait that yearns for interaction and social connectedness. It yearns for companionship. It's a character 
trait of our father. The man no doubt observed the animal creation in terms of companionship within the framework of their respective species. The man's discoursing spirit facilitates his naming and the classifying, the cataloging of the animal creation. And then when the woman is brought to him, he would be prepared to have meaningful interactions with her, no doubt, just as he had with the creator in the cool of the day each day, assuming it was each day. Again, we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. I guess the only question I have to this theory is, how would Eve have been prepared for her side of the social interaction with Adam? Did she come into this marriage relationship inherently possessing that interactive ability? Or would Adam have had to teach her how to interact and communicate with not only him, but Jehovah also? Seems this is a likely possibility. I don't know. It could be either or. Um, or a little bit of both. But again, we can only surmise from what we have before us in our text. I know some would like to say that, well, the woman was smart anyway. Women are smarter often than men. They're, they're just smart. They just have it better together than men most of the time. So it would not surprise me that woman came already pre-programmed to interact with the man. Something to think about. Let's get on. We're moving on to chapter three now. Verse one. Now, the serpent was most cunning of all the beasts of the field that Jehovah Elohim had made. And he said to the woman, thought Elohim said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And then it stops. This is the altar, Robert Alter translation. And it stops in mid-sentence. So this creature, materially a serpent, according to our text, has the capacity to converse with Eve. Whether or not Yah's animal creation at the time had the capacity to converse with, Yah, with Yah's human creation is not evident in this text. However, in the ancient book of Jubilees, there is mention that Yah's animal creation possessed the ability to speak. And that's found in Jubilees chapter 3, verse 28. I don't know if that's true or not, I'm just leaving at that, and I won't mention any more on that other than to say that it would seem this creature, this serpent, was the instrument of a higher spiritual power, most likely that of Hasatan or Lucifer. And he could speak. He could discourse. He could communicate. At least he could communicate such that Eve understood him. And this being powered by Hasatan or Lucifer is verified in John chapter 8, verse 44, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, and Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. I believe this is the most important thing as it relates to the serpent as we move further along in our discussion. We certainly see the same MO, the modus operandi, of the enemy being employed here in our text, as was repeated in his tempting of our master in the Judean wilderness, Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. And that is the asking of a question that challenges the integrity and the veracity of Jehovah's word. Since Jehovah had fashioned just the two humans, unlike the form the tempter took to test our master in the Judean wilderness, he, Hasatan, well, he had few options to manifest himself as, which no doubt led to his choosing to use the most cunning, the most subtle, in the Hebrew, harum, of Yah's creature to effect the deception. Given that Jehovah is all-knowing, he would have known this would or was going to happen. He, in fact, allowed it to happen the using of a member of his animal creation to effect this transgression that was about to come on humanity. The crafty serpent directly approached Hava, or Eve, as opposed to Adam. At least that's what the text says. Why? Most likely due to the woman's 
diminished sophistication. Now, women who are listening to this, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying diminished sophistication because women in general are less sophisticated than men. That is definitely not the case. And I've just said previously that I believe women more times than not tend to be more intelligent and more well put together than men. But what I mean here is that she was created after Adam. So she came into the situation less prepared, less equipped, less knowledgeable, with less experience than her counterpart, Adam. That's all I'm saying. So she did not have the wherewithal, the knowledge, the experience, and so forth that Adam had. For all we know, the serpent may have previously attempted to sway the man, may have attempted to sway Adam, but was unsuccessful. We just don't know, other than the fact that he successfully beguiled the woman. The serpent brings into question the creator's righteousness, the creator's intent, the creator's integrity. Isn't that how the enemy works even today in each of our lives? Does he not set out to convince us that that which we desire for ourselves, that is contrary to Jehovah's will for us, is okay for us to have? Because in the end, Jehovah is going to give us a free pass into the kingdom, right? He seeks to convince us that we deserve that thing we lust for, the evil behaviors and the baggage we cling to so incessantly, the evil thoughts and the feelings we keep going back to, those bad relationships and enterprises that we seek to enter into and maintain and that beset us. That if we are to be truly happy in this life, we must rely on ourselves And have those contrary things that prop up our depraved lives in place. For the enemy tells us, and in many cases convinces us, that life in Messiah is truly not a happy one. It's not fun being a Christian. It's not fun being a messianic. You just can't have fun. It's not good. It's not a good life for us. It's not. And so the enemy targets those weak points in each of us that cause us to be susceptible to his and his seeds' wiles, their tactics, their methodia, if you will. And that's why Shaul taught his Ephesian readers to put on the whole of Jehovah's armor so that we may effectively ward off the attacks of the enemy. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Let's move on to verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the garden's trees we may eat. Now, Alter's translation gives a sense here of a statement being put forth by the serpent to the woman that the woman effectively cuts off in mid-sentence. Recall in verse 1 that it seems as though The serpent's statement, his question, is cut off in mid-sentence. It's as if the woman wanted to correct the serpent right at the start of the questioning, as if she was correcting the serpent's understanding of the situation. This would give credence to her understanding of Jehovah's commandments surrounding that tree. Or does it? Let's continue verse 3. But from the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, Elohim has said, you shall not eat from it and you shall die. Now, many commentators have gone to great lengths to point out that the woman added to Yah's commandment, which we know from Torah, is a no-no in and of itself. If this is indeed the case, the woman was already dead, as she would be proved wrong by the serpent in short order. Could Hava, or Eve, have had a diminished understanding of the prohibition surrounding the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that there may have been some altered understanding such that she believed the tree and its fruits were deleterious or physically poisonous to the well-being of the couple. 
Remember that she described the prohibition or commandment in such a global sense that they weren't even able to touch the tree lest they die. Such a thing does not change the fact that the couple was prohibited from eating of the fruit of that tree in the first place. But the text does lend to a sense that Eve possessed a diminished understanding of the tree and its prohibition. Or at the very least, since Adam had been around longer than she, that he knew more about or knew more than her about the tree and prohibition surrounding that tree. And so, in my mind, it stands to reason that the serpent demonstrated to her that the tree was physically safe for her to partake of its fruit. And we can see how a diminished understanding to the prohibition could certainly lead to her transgressing the command, albeit more accurately being deceived by the serpent which by extension offers us the lesson that our understanding of Jehovah's instructions in righteousness might be lacking in some areas and places in our respective walks, but we are still responsible for adhering to that which we know to be true. We are responsible for staying the course until such time we are informed of Jehovah otherwise. Verse 4. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not die. You, you shall not be doomed to die. You're not going to die. Psh. Seems to me that Eve possessed some degree of an understanding of what it would mean for them or any human for that matter to die. If they took of this fruit. It seems rational to conclude that in order for the couple to understand the implications of transgressing the commandment not to eat of the forbidden fruit, at least on Eve's part, a, a modicum of understanding of the ramifications of the commandment, well, they would surely have to understand what it meant to die, right? So at some point, it would seem that the couple was taught this concept of death and dying, either by Jehovah himself or a messenger, or messenger being an angel, most likely. I tend to think it was Father who spoke directly to them on this, but knowing the consequences of transgressing this commandment would certainly put to the test the couple's hearts and their loyalty to their creator. And for the couple to risk everything they possessed by transgressing the Almighty's commandment regarding the tree, we will see here in the text a couple verses, in a couple verses, that Eve and possibly Adam developed a level of trust in the serpent. You see, when we start trusting the enemy, even a little, 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 little bit, all bets are off. Like I said, Eve was already dead. It's quite conceivable, at least to me, that this creature was a regular guest or visitor of the garden. The serpent no doubt had studied and gained an understanding of its target. What drove them, what inspired them, what they knew and what they did not know. And I would venture to even submit that the creature had regular conversations with the couple leading up to this point in the hist in the story. Indeed, there's a lot of information we don't have here. And for all we know, this leaving certain bits of information out of the text was intentional on the part of our Elohim. Again, thoughts and reflections. Verse 5. For Elohim knows that on the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will become as gods, knowing good and evil. Who are these gods? Who are these gods the serpent is referring to here? Is it possible that these so called gods were Elohim or angels that the couple routinely saw transiting about the garden from time to time? Remember, I had postulated that this garden was an extension of, possibly an extension of, the kingdom of Elohim, the kingdom of God. Again, all based on speculation, based upon what we have here in the text before us. I encourage you to do your own study 
and seek Father's guidance for your own understanding. But I'm just putting these thoughts and reflections out for you. If indeed the garden was an extension of the kingdom of Elohim, the transiting of these beings then were likely a source of great curiosity for Eve. Just putting that down. So it stands to reason that Eve understood what the serpent was trying to sell to her by virtue of her knowing what gods were. And when the opportunity was put forth to her to be like them, simply by taking of the forbidden fruit, well, it was no doubt a done deal in her heart and in her mind. The enemy assures his victim that she and her husband would not be punished as the creator had warned. The serpent basically calling the creator a bold-faced liar. And more so, the serpent entices the woman by extolling the benefits, the virtues they as a couple would enjoy if they partook of the forbidden fruit, such that their eyes would be opened and they would be like the Elohim or the gods. Conceivably, again, the angels, the couple no doubt became accustomed to seeing during their time in the garden. Again, Eve understood what like the gods meant. So there had to have been a reference point for her in order for her to understand this. Verse six, chapter three. And the woman saw that there, that the tree, that the tree was good for eating and that it was lust to the eyes or it was desirable to the eyes. And the tree was lovely to look at. And she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave to her man and he Yah did not, as the serpent erroneously put forth to Eve, set out to keep the so-called knowledge of the gods, the Elohim, from the couple. Obviously, knowing what we know of the character of our creator, this elusive knowledge would come to the couple and their descendants in due time, as Yah saw fit to do so. But at this juncture of human history, it was not Yah's will for that information to be had by the couple nor was it Hasatan's to give. Interestingly, it was the belief and warped position of certain first century Jewish Gnostic sects. Now, you may find this interesting as I did. It was their belief, these Jewish Gnostic sects, that Eve was the heroine of humanity, and thus she was to be worshipped as a goddess of sorts. For Eve, according to these Gnostics, was able to see through the creator's deceptive ways with the serpent's help. That is, Jehovah sought to withhold the knowledge of the universe from his human creation out of a jealousy and fear. Now, these Gnostics contended that such knowledge rightfully belonged to humanity. This evil doctrine was obviously a nascent and early form of humanism, that is, the worship and exaltation of humanity. We find in the ancient book of Jubilees, again, accounting of the beguiling of Eve is somewhat restrictive. It's focused on Eve as the reason for the season. The serpent approached her and tricked or beguiled her into transgressing Yah's instructions. She ate and saw she was naked, covered her nakedness, and she afterward gives Adam the forbidden fruit. She coaxes him into doing wrong, which he ultimately eats, realizes he's naked, sews himself an apron, of fig leaves and covers his nakedness. And this is Jubilees chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. But there is this sense of the woman is the reason for all of humanity's problems. That seems to be the thrust. At least that's how I interpret the book of Jubilees. Again, I take the book of Jubilees as a reference. I wouldn't necessarily take it as far as saying I take it with a grain of salt, But I do read and reference the book of Jubilee with great, great care and caution, as we all should. Verse 7. And the eyes of the two were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves and made themselves loincloths. Question. 
Did the fruit cause some biological reaction within the couple to cause their eyes to be open to the fact that they were naked and that they were in a heap of trouble? Well, some contend this to be the case, while others like me are not so sure. The text does not in any way provide an answer to this probing question. Here's something also to ponder. Was this garden experiment more a test for Eve or for Adam? Who's to blame for humanity's sin, Adam or Eve? Was this a test for Adam as much as it was for Eve? Because obviously Eve was not as sophisticated as Adam. Refer back to what I mean by sophisticated. Wasn't as experienced, as knowledgeable as Adam. She was in what I would describe a vulnerable state, especially vulnerable to the craftiness of this Nakash, this serpent, the enemy. She was primed for being deceived, for being beguiled. That being the case, it could be said that she ended up being a stepping stone by which Adam would transgress the commandment of Jehovah. Hasatan will use the very people in our lives to cause us to fall, to slip up. From time to time, we may find ourselves in a vulnerable position where the people we know and love the most are used by the enemy to trip us up and lead us to yield to a temptation and transgress Abba's instructions and in righteousness. Thus, I believe the target in this case was Adam more than Eve. It was Adam that transgressed Jehovah's commandment, whereas Eve was deceived. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. I would think it was, or it is something, to consider the relationships we have in our lives and what significance we place in those relationships in comparison to our relationship with Jehovah. It was Master who told his followers that if they weren't willing or able to give up competing relationships in their lives, priority-wise, to follow him, then they would be unfit to be his disciples. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Now, Master wasn't saying to abandon spousal and family relationships in order to be his disciple. We cannot walk away from our marriages or close families because we've entered into a covenant relationship with the Almighty unless we are faced with extreme situations that threaten our peace and our walk with Messiah. Such as mentioned by Shaul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, there are times when a member or a spouse goes into faith, enters faith, and the marriage just goes south, and there is a mess. And that's when a lot of intercessory prayer, a lot of seeking Father's direction on how to move forward in that relationship, that has to take place. I'm not talking about those extreme situations. I'm talking about normal, quiet situations where a person enters into faith and then they have to juggle their obligations to father and in the faith and to their families. Because father still holds those who would be his responsible for fulfilling their family obligations. And this is not just fulfilling those obligations begrudgingly. We must fulfill those obligations with sincere loving kindness. Colossians chapter 3 verse 19 and Titus chapter 2 verse 4. Where Paul says we need to love. Men need to love their wives. We have to learn to biblically prioritize how we walk out those relationships in accordance with our relationship with Yah. You see, we have a problem when we put human relationships ahead of our relationship with Father and our Master, whereas those human relationships become priority in our lives. Yes, we're required to give up everything for Jehovah and our Master Yeshua, while at the same time, loving 
and taking care of our families. It's part and parcel of being in covenant relationship with with Father. It's all one package. If we are walking in a biblically-based marriage or family relationship, our covenant relationship with Jehovah will have us die to self, such that we seek to love and serve Jehovah first and foremost, and then also seek to love and serve our family members in accordance with Yah's ways. It's a beautiful thing. And so we cannot allow, however, our family members to dictate to us how we serve, worship, and obey our Elohim. That must be part of the discussion when we go into or come into faith. This story, though, shows us that Adam elected to put his woman before Jehovah. His doing so led to dire results, not just for Adam and Eve, but also for the whole of humanity. So we men must learn from Adam's transgression and listen to and obey Jehovah first and foremost. None of this is to say that we shouldn't serve our spouses or parents or whoever as is our responsibility as godly husbands and children of Yah. None of this is to say that we ignore our spouses, especially when we, they're, they're our helpmeet, they're our sustainer, they, they are beside us. They complete us. But there must be a proper balance. When, when a loved one demands we do not, or that we not do something Jehovah has directed us to do, we must learn to lovingly handle that situation and do that which we've been instructed to do by the eternal. So I'll leave it at that. Let's go to verse 8. We're in chapter 3. And they heard the sound of Jehovah Elohim walking about in the garden in the evening breeze. And the human and his woman hid from Jehovah Elohim in the midst of the trees of the garden. Verse 9. And Jehovah Elohim called to the human and said to him, Where are you? Verse 10. And he said, he being Adam, I heard your voice, I heard your sound in the garden, and I was afraid, for I was naked and I hid. Note here that the man did not confess nor ask for immediate forgiveness of his transgression. He instead framed a convoluted admission that there existed a problem, that he was afraid being found by the Creator without clothing, afraid of being found naked by the creator. Verse 11, from the tree I commanded you not to eat, have you eaten? Is the question father asked. Verse 12, and here is the human's response. The woman whom you gave me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Note here the blame game is learned and played. Was this an effect of the forbidden fruit? This was part of the opening of the eyes? Hmm, something to think about. The pair gave the creator an evasive confession of their transgression. There was no true repentance of their transgression. Instead, when the eternal questions the pair for purposes of fully unpacking the details of their transgression, the evasive confession turns into a blame game. We love to blame. The man blames Jehovah, the woman you gave me. (laughs) Interestingly, Adam was willing to save his own neck by throwing his beloved under the the proverbial bus. I'm sorry. She's the one who caused me to violate your commandment, Father. We see clearly spelled out here that Adam was not inclined to come to the defense of his woman which is interesting to me, the one he should by now love. He didn't take responsibility for his role in the transgression. He didn't come to his sustainer's side to help her. Interesting, huh? Verse 13, And Jehovah Elohim said, To the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I ate. 
So conversely, the woman turns and blames the serpent, who apparently was too ignorant or foolish to flee the scene before the popo arrived. The physical creature that was the serpent here was consigned to a perpetually loathsome state on the earth. No doubt a significant reduction from that elevated original state of his to a state of crawling now, to a state of slithering about on the ground and poetically eating the dust of the earth upon which it moved. The spiritual entity that fueled the physical serpent to perpetrate the deed against Eve, well, would ultimately lose his exalted and powerful state and die like humans through the agency of the seed of the very subject of his attack, of his assault, of his deception, the seed of the woman that would bruise its head. Praise Yah. Psalm chapter 82, verse 7. Let's move on to chapter 3, verse 15. This is Father speaking. Enmity will I set between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. He will boot your head and you will bite his heel. Interesting wording, huh? There would arise then a particularly nasty war between the enemy, Hasatan, and the woman. No doubt women throughout the whole of human history have had to especially endure perpetual tribulation at the hands of men, some of whom actually use this passage and text to justify their heinous and evil treatment of women. And let me also include children in this equation. The woman's seed are the two classes of humanity that are most pursued, that are most attacked and most assaulted and tribulated against by the serpent the Nakash and his seed, both the spiritual and human elements. The pentultimate seed in this prophecy is, of course, Yehoshua, Messiah, and those who would, through Mashiach, become sons of the Most High. And I'm making a reference to the dragon being enraged in the end times and setting out to destroy the woman and her seed, as noted in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. The enemy... Ignorant of the precise details of the Eternal's plan of salvation, redemption, and restoration would bruise, would afflict Mashiach's physical body at the execution stake. But ultimately, the seed of the woman, Hamashiach, would prevail, would conquer death and the grave by the agency of the Creator's Ruach HaKodesh, His Holy Spirit, that same powerful agency that brought order out of chaos and recreated the earth and all therein. And once and for all, the seed of the woman will defeat the enemy and humanity will be restored to the state and purpose in which it was originally created for. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, praise, praise Yah, from whom every blessing flows. Hallowed is your holy and righteous name. Verse 16, chapter 3. To the woman, he said, I will terribly sharpen your birth pangs. In pain shall you bear children, and for your man shall be your longing, and he shall rule over you. So much to get out of this, but uh, we're going to only touch about a few things here. This, this signaled an end to the man's pleasurable tilling and tending duties in the garden, and the beginning of a laborious, arduous, and even painful life of turmoil, the man having to battle against thorns and thistles in order to grow and gather enough food to sustain him and his family. And this penalty would persist until the time when man would return to that which he was made to the ground. And at that time, Adam and Eve began to moderately, slowly, but certainly begin the process of dying. Interestingly, the ancient book of Jubilees gives an interesting perspective on this. The writer notes that a thousand years is a day to Jehovah and the court of heaven and vice versa. Well, it turns out that Adam died at the age of 930, just 70 years shy of a thousand years or rather a day in Jehovah's eyes. Jubilees chapter 4, verse 29 through 30, and Genesis chapter 5, verse 5. And so it turns out that Jehovah was right on the money when he described the couple's death as being in the day they partook of the forbidden fruit that they would surely die. 
back in chapter 2, verse 17. We don't know what age Kava or Eve died, but we can assume it was close to that amount of time. But they were thereafter denied access to the tree of life, which if they had access would have resulted in a whole host of issues and concerns that extend beyond the confines of our discussion here today. It is here, however, that we have before us a foretaste of Jehovah's saving grace, the promise of the Mashiach that would restore all of creation to its original state with humankind being restored to the cool of the day fellowship and relationship with the creator of the universe. Praise Yah. The one who was deceived and who introduced sin and death to the human equation would ultimately bring forth reconciliation and whole life to humanity. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And this is all tied in with verse 17 and 18. And to the human, he said, because you listened to the voice of your wife and ate from the tree that I commanded you, you shall not eat from it. Cursed be the soil for your sake. With pangs shall you eat from it all the days of your life. Verse 18, thorn and thistle shall it sprout for you and you shall eat the plants of the field. Here's an interesting note Note here that Abba was effectively establishing, what, a vegan diet to humanity until such time that he would reverse his prohibition on the consumption of meat. Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. Some people go, what? Where are you getting that from? Well, it's, if you read chapter uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, you kind of get a sense of what I'm talking about. But Father confines them to eating the plants of the field. But then in Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, Father says you can eat that which he has meat, that he has sanctioned as food. It is quite conceivable that Abba needed the population of clean animals that could be consumed as food by his human creation to multiply to an adequate level before giving the couple and their descendants the go-ahead to start eating meat. It's just a thought. Verse 19, by the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread till you return to the soil from there were you taken. For dust you are and to dust shall you return. Note here a sobering reminder of whence we all come. It's a stark contrast to the translated body we will receive when our master returns and establishes his millennial kingdom here on earth. Because we are going to be like our master, Yehoshua. Messiah. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Let's get back to our text. Chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 20. And the human called his woman's name Eve, for she was the mother of all that lives. Thus, we, as she would ultimately be the mother of the life giver, the life giver being Yehoshua Messiah, these would be those who would become sons of Jehovah and enter into life everlasting. Verse 21, chapter 3. And Yehovah Elohim made a skin, made skin coats for the human and his woman, and he clothed them. Verse 22. And Yehovah Elohim said, now that the human has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he may reach out and take as well from the tree of life and live forever. Here's an interesting note. Seems that father was fascinated with his human creation's capacity to imagine and do. There was genuine concern on the, on the father's part that the couple would develop enough sophistication to know that they had to partake of the tree of life to stave off death. The thought of humanity living forever in their depraved state is the epitome of the return of chaos to the world. So he 
goes ahead in verse 23, we read that Jehovah sent him from the Garden of Eden to till the soil from which he had been taken. And he drove out the human and set up east of the Garden of Eden the cherubim and the flame of the whirling sword to guard the way to the tree of life. And it is here that Jehovah employed one of his cherubim to do the job that Adam failed to do, which was to guard the garden, to guard the garden. And in addition to treating, tending, caring for the garden. And these cherubim, uh, the same species of creatures that guard Jehovah's heavenly throne, as mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 10. Thus, this thinking, it completes this circular thought that the Garden of Eden may have been an extension of the kingdom of Elohim here on earth. One of the central themes of this Torah reading, and that, that concludes the reading there, but one of the central things or themes of this Torah reading has to do with willing dependence. Willing dependence. Independence is a byproduct of the human heart. The earnest desire to be independent of Jehovah, willing and able to make its own decision and its own way. This is common to the sinful mind, the sinful heart and soul. The pursuit of independence by Jehovah's human creation flies contrary to the purpose by which Jehovah created us. We were designed and created, formed to be dependent. We cannot fulfill our original purpose as imagers of Jehovah in the earth if we are bent upon being independent. It is a common practice for us to train our children, though, for instance, to become independent of us, their parents, so that they may survive and make a way for themselves in the world and not be dependent upon us as their providers and sustainers. This is indeed a Hebraic concept that is endorsed by Jehovah. The writer of Proverbs counseled that one train up their children in the way they should go so that when they become adults, they will not depart from that way. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Now, the Hebrew way of training up one's child is a holistic one. We train the child in the family trade, business, skill, etc., um, the Apostle Shaul was trained in his family's trade of making goat hair tents. And this is documented in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. And I spoke about this in my uh, Paul and Hebrew Roots series. And this was in association with daily training, though, this training uh, the child in the family trade. But it was done so in association with daily training in Torah and in the ways of the true faith once delivered. It was a two pronged holistic way of training the children. What this holistic approach to training children would ultimately lead to is a child that would grow up being able to engage in a career that would provide income for his or her family, all the while cognizant that one's sustenance, one's increase, one's income comes only from the one who grants him or her the strength, the power to make wealth. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18. We see manifested in Jehovah's punishment and his edicts that were handed down to the fallen couple, his mercy and his righteous judgment. As it related to Yah's righteous judgment, Yah sentenced the man and his descendants to work for their sustenance. That is, by the sweat of his brow would man physically subsist, that he would live until they died and returned to the earth. The mercy of Yah is manifested in his first, not outright killing the couple and all of humanity for their transgression. Two, providing a means by which they could sustain themselves outside the garden. Adam was, was taught and he learned how to till, how to garden, how to grow food. Father's grace demonstrated there. And three, a way back to the relationship the couple enjoyed in the garden with the creator, which would ultimately be accomplished through the personal ministry of Yehoshua HaMashiach. 
In each of these manifestations of Jehovah's mercy, and even in his righteous judgment, Yah would provide Adam and his descendants the principle, the perpetual reminder that their lives are always dependent upon him. Humanity in and of itself is incapable of sustaining itself. Psalm 121, verse 2. Then we got this thing about idolatry at its core that seeks to disassociate humanity from its connection. Um, and I can go into that, but we are really running long. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try to bring this here to a rapid close. I've gone a little long. Um, so... The answer to the question, let's get to the question so we can bring this to a close. Why was Eve not given the dubious distinction of being the progenitor of the human condition? I see it in light of Shaul's clarity of Eve, of Haba, being deceived, a.k.a. having been beguiled by the serpent's craftiness. And I liken this perspective to the scenario whereby many seniors today fall victim to certain scams and financial schemes in their bilk of their life savings. While younger, more savvy individuals do not fall for these scammer schemes, generally the seniors that fall for such schemes aren't sophisticated or knowledgeable enough of certain false businesses, business practices to ward off these criminals. So these are prime for being beguiled or deceived by these crafty scammers. Conversely, the younger, more sophisticated population are aware of the risk associated with the scammers' proposals and will they'll generally resist the temptation to partake in their scams or schemes. However, there are still from time to time those of the more sophisticated lot who, for reasons usually associated with greed, they'll hedge their bets and go in with the scammers and get taken. Now, we know that Adam was created first, then later came Eve. Shaul stated that Eve was deceived, not Adam, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. And it would seem safe to conclude that Adam was at least at a journeyman's level of competency as it relates to understanding the full extent of Jehovah's commandment regarding the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, while Eve well, she could be described as being at an apprentice level of competency. So the fullest responsibility for the transgression, or at the very least knowing better, falls to Adam. Again, Eve fell victim to the serpent's craftiness. Adam, on the other hand, was not deceived. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. He was just stupid. Jehovah rightly accused and convicted Adam for listening to his woman over that of the words of Jehovah, his creator. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. <clears throat> the deception of Eve consisted of a small handful of elements, seeing that the forbidden fruit was actually good to eat, the forbidden fruit was appealing to the senses, and the forbidden fruit would ultimately make her as wise as the gods of or Elohim. Now, Adam's transgression comes on the heel of Eve offering the forbidden fruit to him and then him eating that fruit. Well, it turns out from our text that Adam was present with Eve. The Hebrew term, Hema. He was present at the time the serpent was spinning his deceptive trap for Eve. Chapter 3, verse 6, yet Adam apparently remained silent, nor did he fulfill his Yah-given duty of guarding the garden. Maybe guarding the garden from intruders like the serpent here? Just saying. Ultimately, Adam capitulated and took of the forbidden fruit whether or not the man put up any resistance to any of this is not at all mentioned in the text. But suffice to say, some things within him, his heart probably, was not circumcised enough to resist his woman's agenda that he eat of the fruit or to obey Jehovah over the instructions of Eve, his woman. So, C. 
Sin is at the heart of the relational chaos that ensued when the first couple partook of the forbidden fruit. The beautiful, intimate relationship the first couple enjoyed with Jehovah, and we can only speculate as to the depths and heights of that relationship in the garden. Well, that was terminated. Sin would always get in the way and even inhibit such a relationship in the future because the heart of man is deceptive and desperately wicked. Jeremiah chapter 17, 9. Jehovah cannot and will not have that degree of relationship with human beings. It is only through the personal ministry of Yehoshua HaMashiach, Yeshua Messiah, that that level of relationship is at all possible. Many of us enjoy that relationship. Praise y'all. Also, the intimate, pure, and righteous relationship the man and the woman enjoyed as a married couple was also perpetually damaged. Even in the seemingly best, most healthy marriages, there always exists some degree of strife. Issues of control and domination are always being played out and combated in one way or another. The man and the woman, in order to enjoy that originally original marriage oneness, that was the original intent of marriage, must overcome their selves. Overcome their selves. They must, in effect, die to self, whereby they are willing to serve Jehovah first and foremost and then serve their mate without concern for themselves. That dying to self comes only through Jehovah's Ruach HaKodesh operating in each of us. In Mashiach, we become new creatures and are privileged to walk in the newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. So in Mashiach, selfish, controlling, and fearful agendas are removed, and a sold-out couple in Mashiach can worship Jehovah as one, in spirit and in truth, and in a manner that, as individuals, they could never achieve. Their individual and combined love for Jehovah and for one another will be beyond that of human understanding. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. Thank you for hanging in there with me. I'm going to bring this to a close. I'm sorry that we went over, but there was just so much. And you know what? I didn't even cover it all. But that's just the way I usually roll, isn't it? <laughs> I love you guys. And I want to Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to fellowship. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom. May you and your families be most blessed, fellow saints in training. And then we'll, I'll be willing, be back here next week with Parish of Number Three in our three year tourist cycle. We're also working on a continuation of the Shaul, the Paul and Hebrew Roots series, and our next up. Um, I don't recall specifically, but I'm, I'm halfway finishing up that post and building that and um, researching that. So stand by to, to receive that as well. I'm looking forward to both of them. So until next time, Shabbat Shalom. Take care. Shavua Tov. Be blessed. Be blessed.